Well, with COVID-19 causing churches to put public gatherings on hold, we've turned to various forms of technology to encourage one another during this very unusual season. I'm grateful that we were able to stay connected and minister to one another in these ways while we've been scattered. But as government restrictions ease and lockdown is slowly lifted, we want to take a few moments to remind us all of the importance of gathering together as a local church. In doing so, I want to be extremely sensitive to those who, for whatever reason, don't feel in a position right now to return to in-person gatherings. To you, I want to say to you, that's okay and we love you. Please continue to join with us at home. We do, however, want to address the very subtle temptation and the snare that lurks in the very use of modern technology with all of its benefits, that thinking that it's easy to allow online church to displace the biblical priority of gathering together. Some people might say, well, we don't go to church, we are the church. And while I agree with that sentiment, I think that it's a statement that unhelpfully pits two ideas against one another. For if we truly understand what the scriptures mean when it talks about church, we will see the importance of gathering together. A meeting isn't just something that churches do. A meeting is, in part, what a church is. God has saved us as individuals to be a corporate assembly. We see this throughout the pages of scripture. Picture the nation of Israel rescued from Egypt and gathered together at Mount Sinai ready to hear God's law. Moses would later refer to that day as the day of assembly in Deuteronomy 9 verse 10. And at other key moments in Israel's history, the nation similarly gathered as an assembly before their God. Judges 20 verse 2, 1 Kings 8 14 and 1 Chronicles 28 verse 8, for example. The word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament for assembly, ecclesia or ecclesia, is the same word used in the New Testament to refer to the local church. It's simply the term for gathering. But when applied to the church, it carries the rich Old Testament connotations of standing together as God's chosen people. Consider some of the New Testament images for the church, emphasizing the corporate assembly, gathering in space and time to uniquely display the manifold wisdom, presence and glory of God. Ephesians 2, 18 to 22 says, For through him, Jesus, that is, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Then 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, where Peter writes, As you come to him, again, speaking of Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you, speaking to the church, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So yes, the church is more than a gathering to be sure. It gathers, it scatters, and then it gathers again, and its members continue to be part of the church throughout the whole week as they serve and represent Jesus in their homes, their workplaces, and their neighborhoods. But meeting together is vitally important. That's why the writer to the Hebrews encourages us to consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. As we think about meeting again in person, 
we aren't just gathering at Pomfrey Pavilion to do certain routine, traditional things that we've always done, but we're coming together to meet with the living God and to encounter his glory in the face of Jesus Christ, as 2 Corinthians 3 says. The church is the body of Jesus, and we have the Spirit of Christ in us and with us. We're united to God through Jesus, and we're united together with the people of our church through Jesus. And God is present with his people in a unique and more intensified way when they gather than when they are apart. Consider again the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 12 as he compares and contrasts the experience of the Old Testament people of God, Israel, with the New Testament people of God, the church. He writes, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you, dressing the church again, you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So meeting in person, it won't be the same as before. We appreciate that it may feel weird. We recognize that the measures we put in place will make it harder to be the friendly and welcoming and relational church that we aspire to be. But in these challenging times, it is vital that we comply fully with the government guidance. And we play our part in the national and the local effort to contain the pandemic and be a good witness and a loving neighbour to our community. So let's not approach a return to in-person gatherings purely from a horizontal and personal perspective. And let's not reduce our church to our view of church to merely listening to a podcast or being able to sing or having something for the kids or being comfortable or having all of our preferences met. Instead, let's approach returning to in-person gatherings with a vertical perspective, recognizing that gathering together is an integral part of what it means to be God's new community purchased by the precious blood of his son. And let's remember what God has promised in his word and what he delights to do through his word and by his spirit as his people gather together. Now, up to now, you've probably been mostly aware of the restrictions and what we can't do as a church when we gather. So no singing, no kids work, no coffee, no post-service chat. Some responses to the survey asked if we could meet together as small groups as a first step to returning to in-person services. And in answer to those questions, I just want to be clear that the government guidance for meeting indoors in individual homes restricts gatherings to two households at any one time, or if you meet outside to groups of no more than six people from different households. Until these restrictions are eased, that don't, they don't allow for us to meet in person in small groups in the way that we did at the present time. Let me spend a few minutes thinking about what we can do together and paint a positive picture for all of us of the way forward. We plan on our Sunday in-person services beginning at 10.30 like normal and for the service to run for about 45 minutes, a little bit shorter than the current 65 to 70 minutes of our online format. We're shortening the service because people at the pavilion will have to wear masks and they'll have limited access to toilets. And also because in response to the survey, our thinking has shifted in, into the possibility of allowing children under the age of 11 to attend so that families can worship together. All that on the proviso that parents take full responsibility to ensure that their children stick to the socially distanced COVID secure measures we're putting in place. In terms of kids work, we do hope that in the future we can reintroduce some form of COVID secure children's ministry, but it's currently not possible due to the lack of space at the pavilion. We can't sing together as a congregation, but there is a lot we can do together. And we anticipate our services being full of the following things. We can worship God together alongside one another and praise God through the song videos, just as we do at home, but this time perhaps humming along or mouthing along. We can pray together alongside one another. We can hear the public reading of scripture together alongside one another. 
We can enjoy the puppets and the kids' story together alongside one another. We can share communion together, something that we just haven't been able to do as we've been apart and scattered. And we can hear the preaching of God's word together alongside one another. We can see members of the body face to face, confess our mutual faith to encourage one another and to strengthen the bonds of our unity. And we can position ourselves to encounter God together alongside one another. We plan on doing more of the service live rather than through pre-recorded videos. So over the coming weeks, we plan on taking the call to worship announcements, any interviews or testimonies and corporate prayer live alongside the preaching. If you remain at home and participate in the service online, our goal is that there will be no diminishing of the quality of your experience. We want everybody to experience the same elements of the service and to continue to be fully united as a local church. And coffee and chat will continue after the service for those who are participating online at home so that you can continue to see other people and enjoy some fellowship together. Now space at the pavilion is limited to approximately 30 people, so we will be asking people to pre-book their spaces at a Sunday service. We'll do this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it allows us to allocate seating for you and your family so that you can be seated safely in a socially distanced way from others. And secondly, it allows us to have a weekly register with up-to-date contact information should it be needed by the NHS track and trace system. Rather than operate on a first come, first serve basis, we plan on rotoring the in-person services so that we can mix up the people who attend on every given Sunday. And after the survey responses, it looks likely that you would be able to attend an in-person service once in every three weeks. This will help to guard against there being an idea of an exclusive group that meets in person, which would potentially divide our church into a them and an us situation. So how will attending an in-person service work? Well, you'll, need, you'll receive an email early in the week inviting you to pre-book your slots for the upcoming Sunday service through Eventbrite. You will then have a few days to respond before we open up any leftover spaces to others in the church. Then you just show up at Pomfrey Pavilion at 10.25, ready to go. Attached to this video, there's another video, or attached to the email, there's another video that will show you what to expect at Pomfrey Pavilion. Also attached to this email, you'll find two documents. First, our risk assessment, which we legally have to have in place to allow us to meet. And this out outlines the risks we face in meeting in person and the measures we're taking to mitigate those risks as much as possible to create a COVID secure environment. We're extremely grateful to our risk assessment team of Ash Dyer, Ash and Emily Gunnell, Angie Sussex and Andy Joy, who've put together this uh, document and are overseeing its implementation. You'll also find our community agreement, which we put together so that everybody who attends an in-person service understands and agrees to the expectations in place when we meet together. One other thing that is attached to this email is a link to a second survey that we ask you just to quickly fill out. This will enable us to make a final decision on a couple of elements of our plan before this coming Sunday. So please, respond as soon as possible. And finally, whether you remain at home and join us online, or whether you join us at an in-person service, let us all pray for our church family, asking for God's wisdom and his grace upon all of us as we move forward in faith. Let us recognize our need for humility, gentleness, patience and loving forbearance towards one another so that we might maintain the wonderful unity that God has created in our church family through the one gospel of his one son, Jesus Christ. And may we grow together in our awareness of the riches of God's steadfast loving kindness and mercy towards us in Christ. And may all be done for his glory.